Just one sec. It's been slow loading up. That's all right. Ugh. When all this is over, I am illegalizing the word Zoom in my life. <laughs> it's way overused. All right, so we are up and running. All right, so welcome everyone to Chipaco Chat here at the uh, Mount Desert Island Historical Society. And we are visiting today with Tom McMillan. And he is a scholar of uh, labor uh, history and of the KKK here in Maine. So he finished his MA at the University of Maine and is now working on his PhD up at Concordia University in Montreal. So welcome, Tom, and thank you for joining us today. So when we think of the topic of the Ku Klux Klan, we really don't think of places like Maine. We tend to think of places like you know, Alabama with night riding, with African-Americans and voter suppression or anti-Semitism or some of those types of things. So how does the KKK factor into main history? Uh, great, thank you, Patrick. And thank you to everybody uh, who's watching. Uh, I am going to just share my screen because I have a PowerPoint I'd like to share with everybody. Um, all righty. All right. Yes. Well, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, too, uh, because I uh, did an internship at the Sullivan and Sorrento Historical Society while I was at Maine. And I, I had the pleasure of driving from Orono to Sullivan four days a week for that. So I'm, I'm really excited to present to the Maine Historical, I mean, the M Mount Desert Island Historical Society. Um, so my presentation today is called Remember the Conspirators. The Ku Klux Klan, Progressivism, and the Republican Party in 1920s Maine. And it is a, a labor and political history of the Ku Klux Klan. I'm reimagining it within the uh, progressive era. So first, let me just start off. So just so we're all familiar with which Ku Klux Klan we're talking about, and which is where, uh, to answer your question, Patrick, the confusion often comes in. The first Ku Klux Klan was a Southern organization that was based, um, in, started in Tennessee after the Civil War, but that was suppressed. And in 1915, the second Ku Klux Klan was reborn in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it was inspired by Civil War nostalgia, by uh, open racism and Jim Crow laws in the South, and as well as opposition to immigrants, especially Jewish immigrants. Um, through the magic of modern day marketing, um, it spread nationwide after World War I and tapped into a, the feeling of intense resentment um, towards immigrants and leftists and others, um, as well as the spirit of fraternalism among white men and including my white women. Um, and it was brought to Maine in 1922, as far as we can tell by an anti-Irish activist named uh, F. Eugene Farnsworth. Um, he had been involved in anti-Irish uh, independence movement prior to uh, joining the Klan. And what they really believed in was white Protestant supremacy. So any group that threatened this, in their mind threatened it, including African-Americans, immigrants, um, Jews, um, Catholics, leftists, feminists, um, LGBT people, um, really anybody who threatened that was considered an enemy and a target. So in a place like Maine, which didn't have a large African-American population, uh, the primary targets were Catholics. And I will talk about that um, and, and how that manifested itself. In Maine, it, you know, as a secret society, we don't know how many people were members, um, but we do know thousands and thousands of people were members and they had organizations across the state, um, claverns as they were called. 
And our best guess nationwide is that there were three to six million members at its peak, which was more, uh, more members of the Ku Klux Klan than were members of trade unions um, in 1924. Uh, outside of the South, they used political action more than lynching or terrorism. And that is a distinction that I think is really important to make um, and a difference. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is that the Ku Klux Klan is often, often associated as a Democratic Party organization. And it was when it was founded in 1865, it opposed Republican uh, Reconstruction. But in the second Ku Klux Klan, they did not believe in political partisanship. And they uh, strictly said, well, join the political party that is dominant where you are. So in Maine, which was a, and I'll talk about this, Republican Party dominant state, every Klan member, as far as I can tell, was a Republican. In Mississippi, it would have been the opposite. Every Klan member would have been a Democrat. Uh, and it was famous for constant infighting and corruption because it was in some ways a very lucrative scheme for the people at the top and uh, very um, tempting to take advantage and to grab as much money as you can. Uh, may be familiar to people listening today, there are uh, sort of multi-level marketing schemes is a good example of this today. Uh, pictured is a march of the Klan through Portland in 1923. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview of the timeline of Ku Klux Klan politics, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, the picture here is Ralph Brewster, and I'll get to why he's pictured in a moment. But the first Ku public Ku Klux Klan meeting was held in Portland in 1923 at the Knights of Pythias Hall. Um, and by the end of the year, they had, the Klan had played an instrumental role in replacing Portland's longtime government and siding with the um, big business inspired city manager system that uh, if you look into Portland politics today is having a brand new discussion about this 98 years later. Um, the following year, Ralph Brewster, who was a Portland um, school board member and state senator, uh, very narrowly won a marred election for the Republican uh, nomination for governor with the Klan's backing. And it was widely known that Brewster was, uh, was the Klan candidate, if, though there is no evidence that he himself ever formally became a member. Um, there are Klan um, brochures that were mailed to him that are in his archive, uh, in his papers at Bowdoin College. And in September of 1924, uh, really this issue of the 1924 election was about the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, he won the Republican Party uh, to nobody's surprise at the time, but they beat a, a Democrat who ran on a really strictly anti-Ku Klux Klan um, platform. So fast forward two years, um, Maine had a Senator named Bert Fernald. Um, he dies unexpectedly in August of 1926. Uh, Maine elected, candidates, um, every, state government every two years at that time period. And so Brewster is reelected the following month as governor with the backing of the Ku Klux Klan that never changed. Um, and in October, the man pictured here, Arthur Gould of Presque Isle, he won a heavily contested primary over Percival Baxter, who many people may be familiar with as well as the clan backed Hogden Buzzle of Belfast, who had been state Senate president. Um, this caused a lot of animosity. Um, uh, seats in the US Senate did not become open very often and they were highly contested and winning the Republican primary basically guaranteed becoming the Senator. So the following month, the Ku Klux Klan tried to undermine the attempt of Gould to get elected. Um, they brought forward ethics charges, charges of campaign finance violations, um, charges of bribery, um, which he had made a bribe in New Brunswick. Um, and uh, despite that, he was easily elected over the Democrat in an unexpected victory, um, especially the size of the victory. Um, the Ku Klux Klan is in real steep decline at this time period, and we'll get to that a little bit later. 
Uh, two years later, Brewster, who was ever the opportunist and, and career riser, uh, he, challenged Fred, he challenged Frederick Hale for the Republican nomination, and he loses badly. The Ku Klux Klan plays a major role in his loss. He's alleged to be a Klan member. Um, and the Klan is disgraced. And the leader, DeForest Perkins, uh, of the Ku Klux Klan resigns, and the Klan and he disappear from public political life. So what was the progressive era? Because that's really the crux of my argument. It was the first 20 or 25 years of the 20th century. Uh, and hopefully everyone, many people are familiar, but I'll just do a quick rundown. Um, this was a period of growing industry in the United States as a whole. Um, industrial production soared, cities got much bigger, immigrants, uh, especially Catholics and Jews came and filled uh, manual labor spots in those cities and to some extent the farms. Uh, the, as a result um, of the growth and in income inequality, uh, class conflict erupted and that was very common. There were many strikes, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, maybe one that people are familiar with and uh, that of this uh, increased class conflict and labor laws becoming central to the United States. There was the growth of government. So this is when you have the creation of national parks, the Food and Drug Administration uh, and immigration restriction uh, for the at a wide scale for the first time. Uh, women got the right to vote, Native Americans got the right to vote, but at the same time, uh, civil rights like Jim Crow laws and the uh, et cetera were common and African-Americans were largely disenfranchised, especially in the South. Um, if you're thinking of who to associate with this, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Jane Addams, these are some of the most famous figures from the progressive era. So think reform, right? Increase in government size and, and changes in the way the government operated. So my thesis essentially is that if we look at the Ku Klux Klan as a middle-class organization of lawyers, farmers, real estate developers, shopkeepers, and some manual laborers, uh, sk most skilled manual laborers uh, in Maine in particular, very middle-class white collar organization. And the Ku Klux Klan kind of functioned as a political organization as well as a hate group. Don't get me wrong. It was still very much a hate group. Um, but to enact those hate, it's, it's hateful vision, it, act, it worked as a political organization that sought to use state regulation, so the growth of the state, which was common in this period, against both um, a small, a quote, small but financially powerful group associated with big business, uh, as well as the poorest class of white-skinned men and women associated with the Catholic Church and socialism, um, to make sure that small property holders in the Ku Klux Klan would be dominant as the society changed dramatically. Um, so in Maine, just briefly uh, about the progressive era, uh, it was a period uh, much like in the rest of the country. Maine was a very enthusiastic and adopter of progressive reforms. So uh, Theodore Roosevelt was extremely popular in Maine. Uh, Maine adopted the direct primary, the citizens initiative, the referendum. Pictured is the Wyman Dam um, some on the, in Somerset County on the Kennebec River, um, which was built during this time period and which uh, was one of the largest dams in the United States at the time it was built. And uh, there was a lot going on in the Maine woods to fuel this development. And Bert Fernald, who I mentioned previously, he was a conservationist, and in order to prevent overdevelopment in the woods, he sought to uh, ban the sale, the, out, the export of hydroelectricity, which was called white gold, which was Maine's most important per product, even more than timber at the time. Um, and uh, they passed that law. Um, so the electricity produced at the Wyman Dam uh, would play an important role in our story later on. Uh, Maine was the first state to adopt alcohol prohibition um, in the 1850s, and it was an enthusiastic supporter of alcohol prohibition, or at least among some people, as well as having a strong women's suffrage movement. So I want to just uh, talk to you a little bit about man. Uh, I've done a lot of research on him, DeForest Perkins. Uh, he's from North Brooksville, 
Maine, so not that far from Mount Desert Island. And he attended the East Maine Conference Seminary in Bucksport. And in a way, he's kind of an archetypal progressive era uh, social figure in Maine, though not well known today. Um, he was an educator. He went to the University of Maine, like Patrick and I, and he did his master's in history um, there. Uh, he became, he was a teacher. He taught all over rural Maine in one room schoolhouses and small private academies. Um, eventually became a superintendent of schools in Skowhegan and in uh, Portland, uh, where he became most famous. Um, he saw the light and saw that there were a lot of money to be made outside of public education. And so he became the secretary of the Portland Chamber of Commerce during a key period and uh, where he would interact with, I, I would argue, many uh, future Klansmen, including DeForest Perkins, I mean, including Ralph Brewster. And he was also a real estate developer and he owned a mass, a huge number of properties um, in the Portland and Cumberland County area, including, interestingly, the Abyssinian, what is now known as the Abyssinian Meeting House. Um, which some people may be familiar with as the first black church, one of the first black churches in the United States. He owned it and convert, he's converted it into a tenement building, um, which uh, I can talk about later if you want. But he became the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. But not only was he a Klansman, but he, as you can see in this picture, he doesn't look like a raving uh, buck tooth uh, sort of stereotype that we think of Klansmen because he wasn't. He was well-educated. Um, and he was the head of the Maine Teachers Association. And this picture hangs on the wall of the Maine Teacher Association office. And they sent it to me. So thank you, MTA. Um, and so as superintendent of schools, he banned German during World War I. He defended child labor laws. He was a member of the Progressive Party, which was associated with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He was a friend of certain labor unions, of white supremacist unions that only admitted white members and that were actively patriotic, um, especially on the railroads. Uh, more assertive unions, he was a union buster. So he, would, he, bu he ran the Congress Square Hotel in Portland and he busted a strike there. And he fought the open shop to prevent a union from having there. So he is a conservative progressive. And I know that might be a contradiction for some people, but uh, if we think of progressivism as a way, uh, the use of government for middle class people to change government and to change society through government regulation, um, he was very much a progressive um, in every sense of the word. Um, if you th think of George Babbitt and Sinclair Lewis's Babbitt, the book Babbitt, he is, in many ways, in, in my opinion, very similar to George Babbitt. Um, so how did the Ku Klux Klan, my argument, right, is that they fought both the working class and the rich in different ways. And so how did they fight against the working class? Well, they worked alongside big business when it was useful for them. So uh, pictured in the background here is a Portland Press Herald uh, headline from February 1924, when um, the Ku Klux Klan aided big business to get rid of the industrial workers of the world, a radical labor union that organized everybody, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, um, gender, et cetera. Um, and they organized French Canadian workers in the Maine woods in Greenville. And so the KKK, uh, the big business community didn't like this. And the KKK mobilized to try to get them out of town. As you can see, it cleared the woodsmen uh, from their boarding houses and forced them to stay outside in the cold in sub-zero temperatures in the winter in Greenville, which everyone can probably imagine was not very fun, um, and subsequently broke their unions and put them in jail, put their leaders in jail. Um, and I can talk more about this later as well, but uh, the Ku Klux Klan also sought to regulate the private and religious lives of working people, especially Catholics and people of color. Um, so, Pictured here, right? This is just a summary of some of the ways the Ku Klux Klan tried to regulate working class life. Um, they enforced alcohol prohibition, though usually that meant for working people. They tried to ban interracial marriage, which again affected working people. They uh, tried to reduce the influence of the Catholic Church and uh, French language education, um, which again affected working people. Um, 
They sought to tighten discipline in the state prison. Uh, and they worked for electoral reforms that we have today, actually, like the direct primary, which in some ways uh, were used to reduce the influence of immigrants and workers in public office. Um, pictured here is John Sturgis. He was a state representative and farmer from Auburn. And he was a, as you can see, a former Progressive Party member as well. And he sponsored a bill in 1927 to ban interracial marriage between African Americans and white people in Maine and make it a felony to, to either officiate a marriage or to get married in that situation. Um, I don't know that he was a Klansman, but it's less important who was a Klansman and who wasn't and who was part of their movement. And he was certainly part of the movement involved in everything listed here. But they didn't just fight the work, working class. And I think this is something that people sometimes forget. Uh, they also competed with big business, but really only in electoral politics. The elections were key to this competition. They were not uh, going to rich people's houses and trying to fight them like they were the woodsmen of the IWW. So after they helped the big business community gained control of city government in 1923. They refused to endorse the president of the Chamber of Commerce in the election for the new city council. Um, in 1924, again, their candidate was defeated by the quote big business element in the 1924 city council election. And even as late as 1930, uh, a possible Klansman, someone again in the movement, um, targeted the big business. Um, community as the quote, the real Klan. Um, and in 1926, when their Klan candidate ran for US Senate, he decried the other candidates as two millionaires, um, which is, is definitely competition with, uh, and uh, one of those was Percival Baxter. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit soon. Um, they also had an alternative vision for Maine's hydroelectricity. While the Klan itself never commented on hydroelectricity in Maine, at least, uh, all of the Klansmen that I have um, looked at who were state legislators or uh, affiliated like uh, the governor, Ralph Brewster, had a vision where they supported small property holders along with conservationists and tourism um, people, tourism, uh, those in the tourist industry, uh, had a different vision than big property holders who were the ones building dams like the Ripagenus Dam in Greenville or the Wyman Dam on the uh, that I previous in Somerset County. They all sided with this uh, rural belief in uh, local industry over big business. And in 1927, there was a bill to allow the export of this electricity to Massachusetts, uh, and Brewster vetoed it. In 1929, there was a referendum and it was defeated by a uh, referendum. So until the 1950s, hydroelectricity produced in Maine could only be used in Maine. You couldn't export it north to Canada and you couldn't export it to uh, elsewhere, New England or further west. So this big business uh, competition plays out as well in the 1926 special election that I mentioned earlier. Um, basically, the Klan, as I mentioned, the Klan candidate lost, um, the one who supported, uh, who opposed sending electricity out of state. Um, and so uh, days before the election, um, a very key election that was central to uh, the Republican control of the Senate, which uh, shares a lot of parallels with this election we just had in Maine with Susan Collins and Sarah Gideon and Lisa Savage. Um, in, in that the Republican Party really wanted to win because it was key to them retaining control of the Senate, the Klan alleged ethics violations. They appealed to Maynard's sense of good government, and they alleged that he had committed bribery in New Brunswick, uh, that he had spent too much money on the campaign. Uh, they alleged he spent more than $1,500, which is laughable, especially given the most recent election but that was the limit that a candidate could spend in 1926. Uh, and they alleged he had outspent it, but they were unable to prove it. But despite this, Governor Brewster refused to endorse the Republican, which as you can see in the newspaper, uh, 
basically they turned Brewster into the devil that he had tried to destroy as the remember the conspirators name implies an unholy alliance label applies that he had tried to destroy the Republican party essentially and had the Ku Klux Klan was trying to destroy um, to try to turn Maine a democratic state although they didn't endorse the Democrat directly. Um, even after the election, though, there was a public hearing in Washington on whether to seat Gould and allow him to serve in the Senate. And they worked with a very progressive Senator uh, Walsh of Montana, who worked with both Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt to try to unseat him. And uh, they failed. But I think that was their plan. They wanted to um, turn him into a uh, toxic person who the Senate itself would, would remove. Um, this hurt the uh, Ku Klux Klan quite a bit, and they turned, they basically became uh, an obscure political organization in Maine. Um, in, by 1928, when uh, Governor Brewster was then candidate Brewster running for U.S. Senate, as I mentioned, um, the Ku Klux Klan is nowhere to be found. They are a minimal organization in the state, and they are almost nowhere in the news. It's kind of shocking how little there is about them. Uh, after he loses, DeForest Perkins uh, resigns, uh, but you can see that it was only learned about two weeks later that he had resigned. So that's how little uh, political impact they had at the time. It was not even a big deal that their leader had resigned. Um, Brewster is disgraced. He loses. Uh, he tries to run for Senate in 1930. He loses. He tries to run for Senate in 1930. He runs for Congress eventually, and he wins uh, in 1932, and he becomes a senator after that, and he becomes a key ally of Joseph McCarthy and the Red Scare and the uh, McCarthyism, which some people may be familiar with. And finally, I argue my contribution to the way we think about the Ku Klux Klan is that the Ku Klux Klan, in a way, died along with progressivism in the Republican Party. Um, the growth of like free trade and big business dominance in the Republican Party coincides with the decline of the Ku Klux Klan as a political force and uh, main. And, and so by 1928, 1930, there's really no Ku Klux Klan to speak of in the state, um, at least as a political organization. It's still a fraternal group with a minority of people, but it is no longer part of main politics in the way it had been before. So uh, with that, I thank you for, for uh, attending today. And I would love to hear any questions that people have. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. A very enlightening uh, conversation. If you do have questions for our speaker, if you look on Zoom, if you're joining us there, if you'll put it into the chat option, uh, that is open. If you're joining with us on the live stream on Facebook, the comment section there. Uh, that is open to you. So uh, feel free to share any questions that you have for him. Uh, as you type in your questions, uh, I have the first one, uh, sort of my microphone's on privilege, I guess. Uh, my question relates to the distinction that you're drawing between the Klan movement and the Klan itself. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the distinction that you're drawing between those two. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Um, typically, when people write about the Ku Klux Klan, they focus on the organization and who um, was a member and uh, what was the organization itself doing. But it was a secret organization. And we don't know in most places who was and was not a member, uh, but we do kind of know the archetypal people who were um, part of the movement, who shared this, what our uh, classmate at Maine, uh, Tyler Klein, calls patriotic Protestantism. Um, and so what I think the, the other part to remember is that the Ku Klux Klan had massive, massive um, swings in membership. So it, people joined it for sometimes a very short time period and then left. Um, and so those people are, are no less part of a, a movement of patriotic nativist Protestants, um, believers in Protestant white supremacy 
um, just because they have left the organization. The organization itself was, was fraught. Um, as I said, there was corruption, there was infighting, there were expulsions, um, there were parallel organizations that were set up uh, because people saw that there was money to be made alongside this. So I think it's less important to focus on who it's, who was a member because we don't know. And also because there's really no evidence that people's mindsets changed just because they stopped paying um, in, you know, initiation fees and such into the organization itself. All right, well, thank you for that. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, what was the Franco-Canadian class composition in Maine society? Yeah, the, the overwhelming number of people, Franco-Canadian, Franco-Canadians in, in Maine were workers. Um, they were, uh, they worked in mills, they worked in the woods, um, you know, Jason Newton has written a lot about this. I would recommend anyone interested in this to, to read his work. Um, they were seen as half wild people who were um, who, who were good for hard labor, but not um, respected as part of Anglo um, Protestant society, much like in Quebec where I am right now, uh, similar at the same at the time. So, overwhelmingly they were workers and they were incorporated into sort of mainstream white Anglo society really only after World War II. All right, we have a quick comment on the chat. Uh, thank you, Bill, for uh, this memory. Uh, when the church in the down by the library in Northeast Harbor was being renovated, uh, they found some KKK signs up in the belfry that had been put in there by the builders. Wow. So a, a church steeple for KKK. <laughs> Fascinating. You know, um, the archival record of the clan in Maine is really limited. So if anyone ever finds things like this or has pictures of them or finds an old newspaper of the clan or anything like that, it would be extremely helpful for researchers if you could contact the Mount Desert Island Historical Society uh, and, and put that into circulation because, for example, the Ku Klux Klan published at least six, six um, editions of its newspaper, but we only have two of them. Um, and we don't have, because it was a secret society, because its uh, main office in Portland burned suspiciously, um, in 1923, um, we don't have records. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to recreate something without a, an archival record. So uh, thank you, Bill, that's interesting. And uh, the Klan did have a big presence on MDI um, and uh, that's been written about that uh, excellent work that I've seen. Um, and uh, I think more, more needs to be done with that. All right, so we are unfortunately up on time. So if everybody will join with me in thanking Tom McMillan for sharing with us today, a very fascinating talk. And we will meet everybody here again in two weeks time with the next edition of Chewbacca Chats. So thank you and have a good rest of the evening. Thank you everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>